Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Am I live? It didn't work? The green light's on. Oh, I'm good? Okay. So I'm going to do everybody's favorite thing tonight, and I'm going to give you an abbreviation. Okay? And maybe it is your favorite thing. And I say that, and hopefully I've never told this story before. But many years ago, I shouldn't say many years ago, okay? I'm only 45, okay? But to me, it was many years ago. I was, uh, I got hired at this job. I was about 20 years old. And I got hired at this job, and this guy, and you know how when you're in a new job, you want to ask questions, but you also don't want to look like an idiot. So this guy's escorting me around this massive warehouse, and he kept saying the whole time, all day long, this is an eight-hour, basically eight-hour job orientation. He kept saying, FYI. Now, I had no clue. Up to that point, I don't, I had, don't ever remember hearing that term, FYI. And I kept thinking, what is this guy? I'm like, I probably should ask him. What is this guy talking about? FYI, FYI, FYI. So, you know, I'm you know, cataloging all these things he said FYI about into my brain. And then I'm thinking, I'm going to look this up as soon as I, you know, get an opportunity. And then I looked it up, and, you know, for your information. I'm thinking, you're such an idiot. How did you not, how did you not know what this guy was talking about? But I didn't, okay? Now I know what it means, okay? And maybe you have, ter at where I work, we have ter different terms. I'm not going to give them away. They're probably government secrets. I don't know. But, um, we have different terms for different things. And you, uh, if, if, you're, if a fire alarm goes off, you're supposed to follow this four, you know, uh, four word abbreviation. So we're going to use one of those tonight. Um, often, especially this time of year, um, when you enter a store, someone will ask, How can I help? Right? Or, or is there something you're looking for? Especially if you go into a, a good store, in my opinion. That's just my opinion. Uh, I don't want to call out certain store names, okay, free advertising, okay, but there's a certain hardware store that I love to go to because every five steps, someone who knows what they're talking about is coming up to you and saying, can I help you? Is there anything you're looking for today? Instead of other massive hardware stores that you go into, and you think all their employees died in, a, in an explosion because there seems to be nobody there. And you search high and low, and there's no employees everywhere, right? So the church is supposed to be a place where people can get help, right? It, this place should be a place where people can get help. That's what we should be known for. And I think we are known for that. So I want to look briefly tonight at ways... We can help in all four points. One starts with H, one starts with E, one starts with L, and one starts with P. So maybe you can remember this. If you can't, that's okay. But the first one is humility, ways that we can help. We can be humble. It says, in, uh, in all these, I'm going to read a definition for each point. And all these definitions unless I say different, came from the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, just so you know. So, humility is freedom from pride and arrogance, humbleness of mind, a modest estimate of one's own worth, lowliness of mind. And in Acts 20, I asked you to turn to Acts 20, look in, in verse 17. It says, in verse 17, it says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus... And called the elders of the church. And when, the, when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews, and how I kept back 
nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, it says here that he was humble. He served the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which that's not part of our message, but with humility. He came to them with humility. That goes back to humbleness of mind, a modest estimate of one's own worth. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may... That, what's, this, what's that part? He may exalt you in due time. Not you, which I'm speaking for myself. Sometimes I exalt myself. That he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So he says, clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want God to resist me. And God's word says that when we have pride in our heart, that he resists us. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. I've got a few quotes uh, here about humility or uh, along that theme. It says, um, one of them I read was, and this is an old word, so I'll explain it. Um, Beware of the man who kowtows, and kowtow means to kiss up or be excessive. You ever meet somebody that's excessive? They're, show, they, they're showing respect, but they go like too far, if you know what I mean. <laughs> that's excessive. Um, beware of the man who kowtows to his superiors or is rude to his inferiors. When you're, you're flowery with your superiors and you are rude to people that are below you, somebody gave me this advice. Years ago, and I thanked him when he retired for giving me this advice. When I first started, year, oh, I was at Willard for 12 years. So I was there, and I got there, and I was overwhelmed. And after learning from my FYI experience, I figured I better ask questions. Because if I, I, want, I don't want to be behind you know, when I come into the workplace. And I said to this guy, and, and there... We um, woke up at 5.30 every morning, and the inmates ran, and they did PT, and they had to march everywhere, and I've never served in the military, and I had no idea what to do. And my, t- my in-step thing is not in-step, right? You, you would actually have to run, I'm not gonna demonstrate, but you would have to run in-step, and you'd have to shout, sing a cadence. Well, I can barely sing without walking, let alone singing while I'm running, and making sure my left foot hits the ground at exactly the right time. Disaster. So I used to tell them, I, say, I would say, don't look at me. I would always pick out the guy, the inmate, who could, had, could keep the best time. And I would put him in the front on the left-hand side. And I would say, follow the squad leader, the first, the first squad leader. Don't look at me. Just listen to me. Don't look at me. That's what I used to say to him because my feet are all wrong. But the one guy I worked with, I said to him, I go, I don't know what to do. I go, I, this is so different for me. Usually you just go in and wait for something to happen. These guys, that you really got to get involved in what's going on here. And he said, he said something very important to me that I've tried to follow even with my children. He said, never ask them to do something that they know you can't do 
or are not willing to do. Because some of these guys, they'd get gung-ho and they would, they would have them do a thousand jumping jacks. These guys are looking at the guy and they're doing them because they don't want to lose their program. But they know that guy can't do a thousand jumping jacks. And they, go, and they know that guy would never even attempt that. Or if you're teaching them about respect, they have to see that you're respectful. You're not asking them, you're not looking down. I mean, yeah, you're over top of them, but you're not looking down upon them, not rude to your inferiors. Your kids, you know what? <laughs> you can ask my kids. I just did this to them yesterday. The, um, I won't say who. Okay, I have four, so you can guess. But I won't say which group of children it was, but they bo both groups of children, two boys, two girls, they share bedrooms. I know... I'm that mean dad. All my kids don't have their own room. I'm sorry, okay? I've heard pe people have said that to me. I'm like, well, sorry. We're not adding on to the house so everybody can have their own room. Um, which, if you can have your own room for all of your children, God bless you. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, okay? But we had a little lesson about cleanup. And I went into this room, and I said, follow me, please. Let's go down here to my bedroom. And I said, we just came home from somewhere. And I said, where are all my clothes? We don't know. I go, they're put away. I'm not telling you to do something that I'm not doing myself. Now, am I, you can ask my wife, and she'll probably have a Pentecostal fit. And in, in agreement with this, I don't always do the right thing, okay? I occasionally will leave... My weakness is piles. Organized, neat piles, but piles, okay? And I'll say, but it's all neat. I, I, I have to have that stuff. I, I got to look through that. There's something I got to mail out, you know? How about if I keep all my piles on the desk downstairs, but I'll keep the stuff clean upstairs? So that's the compromise that we've reached. I keep the tables clear upstairs, but there's a big pile downstairs. Someone organized, right? But... Again, not, don't ask people to do things that they know you're not willing to do yourself. you got to be humble. You want to be a good church member? You have to be humble. You want to help people? I want to help people. You have to be humble. The man who humbly bows before God is sure to walk upright before men. God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. Isn't that the truth? If pride, is, if, if, if pride is absent, guess what is absent also? The Bible tells us. Contention. If you have contention, and, and we're talking in a church set, setting, but if you have contention with another Christian brother, and don't sit here and say that you never do, that you always agree with everybody, well, then I have words to describe that. But anyways... Right? You, you're, we all disagree with each other, right? Maybe you don't like the color blue for the carpet. I, whatever. I'm not trying to cause trouble. I'm just saying there's, maybe you don't like the way someone greets you or whatever. There's going to be contention. And I tell this, in, and it's the Bible, right? But I tell this to my kids all the time. See, but the problem is with this person. And I'll say, but you're fighting with them. So you, guess what you have? You have pride too. It's not just the other person. Right? If we, if we have a disagreement with one another, and I don't like, you know, oh, this, 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 this guy does this, and it really drives me nuts. Well, guess what? And, and I pick a fight with him. Well, then guess who has the problem? I have a problem with pride, because I think my way is better. Everybody needs to be like me. Well, no, please don't be like me, Right? So if pride is absent, so is contention. If pride is absent and we have humility, no job is too big or too small. Right? That means that if you see a paper on the floor, you don't say, well, I, I'm not the church cleaner. Pick up the paper. The Bible says, and I know it's referring to speaking in tongues and you know, getting wild in the church service and everything, but in 1 Corinthians it says, let the things that are to be done decently and in order. 
but the precedent is also set in the Old Testament. You look at the details. Every time I read through there, I think, people that think it's not important that we treat God's house correctly, where do they get that from? Look how much chapter after chapter in the Bible about measurements and about things being uh, the proper way and all those, all those things. Why? Because God cares about his house. Uh, we, we talked in junior church today about um, Moses and the burning bit, the, the burning bush, right? And he took off his shoes because he was standing on holy ground. Because God was dwelling there. Well, don't we want God dwelling in our church? Don't we want the presence of God in our church? Yes, we do. Well, if, we, if it's a holy place, and if you see one of them running, please come find me. But I always tell my kids, there's no running in church. This is not a gymnasium. And this isn't a message about kids. Okay, don't. But I'm just saying, this is a holy place. I was taught as a kid that it's important that you're in God's house. Yeah, does that mean we all walk around with robes on? And No. But there's a reverence. My grandfather used to tell me, and he took it seriously. And he was a jokester. Wow, he was a jokester. <laughs> my grandpa Fritch. But he used to tell me, and I, this sticks to my, in my mind to this day. He used to say, we're walking into the sanctuary. It's time to stop. He only said it to me one time. But I watched him. A guy who loved to joke, loved to fool around, loved to take chances, do crazy stuff. You know, he was fun like that. But when he walked into church, he knew it was time to be serious. And he would get really quiet. He'd be friendly to people, but he'd sit there in his pew a couple minutes before the service, and he would get ready for church. That is an attitude of humility. That's the way we should approach. This is a serious time. This is not a, you know what? Hey, I like football. Don't get me wrong. And a little part of me, okay, for a minute, and then I had to pray about it, was like, why did pastor ask me to preach today? The bills are playing. <laughs> right? And I knew nothing about the Bills game. Well, except for I listened to it for a little bit in the car. I knew nothing about the score or nothing until he mentioned it. Right? Again, 100 years from now, it's not going to matter if the Bills beat the Eagles. I hope they do, because I don't like the Eagles. But anyways, <laughs> right? But, any, <laughs> right? It doesn't matter, right? Because we're in God's house. It's, 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 it's a time. If, if it's... <laughs> To, this is what I tell my kids all the time. I try to teach this, and I, ho I hope I succeed. I say, listen, if God is not real, and if, and if what we're doing isn't real, there's a lot of other things I can be doing on Sunday. Sometimes, you know, and, and I know some of you are the, the same way, I've worked 70 hours by Sunday. There's a lot of other things I could be doing. This is important. Right? And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm talking to people in a church on Sunday night. I know that. But you understand that. And I also, I, I think of this. Um, this, <laughs> this is simple. But I tell my kids this all the time, and I tell this to kids in junior church too. So, excuse me. I hope they do it at home. Okay? But if you go into the bathroom and you see there's a mess in the bathroom, or you made the mess in the bathroom. Pick up after yourself. It's God's house. Yeah. It takes a, a second. You know who I learned that from? Mr. Breyer. Yeah. Yeah. That guy spent, <laughs> I think he was a, ba a, a bathroom inspector or something. That guy spent a lot of time in the bathroom. Because <laughs> he loved to talk to people. But he was always, you'd go in there and he'd be singing and he'd be cleaning. Not that it was dirty in there, but he was cleaning up after himself, cleaning up after others, so that when the next person comes in or a visitor comes in, then he'll go, yeesh, what happened in here? Right? Why? That's important. We teach our kids, you know, we have a, a guest bathroom, you would call it, in our house in the hallway. That's where the guests use the bathroom. We tell our kids, you don't know when somebody's walking in the door, you can't leave, because it's the kid's bathroom too. You can't leave this stuff here. Why? Because it's important. You can't just say, and we have chores. Hopefully you have chores at your house. And we have chores, and okay, this week it's uh, Timothy's week to clean the toilet. I made that up. I don't know if it is or not, Timothy. Mommy keeps track of the chore schedule. 
right? But I don't know if it's his week to clean the toilet or not. But if it is, Titus shouldn't go in there and say, well, I'm not cleaning it up. It's Timothy's week. Now, maybe Timothy would do that. But <laughs> I don't know if he would or not. He probably he does. Kids do thing, kids things, right? But the idea is there's no job, right? You see something that needs to be done, do it. Now, I'm not... Listen, I'm not up here saying, I've noticed a lot of things. No. You'll notice, and if you don't notice, that's fine. I'm a little weird about this. We went to church. See, it's, it's, it's weird how certain things stick with you. We went to, When I was a kid, back when you could have the free roam of the campus, they're a little more strict now. When we were a kid, we went on a vacation, and we went to West Point. And, we, and they, back then, they used to let you just walk in wherever you wanted, pretty much. And we went into the church in West Point. And when you walk in the back door of the church, every hymn book is lined up perfectly all the way from the front to the back. I mean, it's not one hymn book is out of order. Guess what? When you take the hymn book out and you're done with it, to make it easier for someone else, put it back in there. There's two, if you have my size fingers, there's two fingers that should go in between the red book and the blue book on either side, just if you were wondering. And I say that because every time I sit down, now I probably didn't do it this time, my wife, I just saw her looking at it. I, I put my finger in between before I leave the pew, I, I try, so that next time somebody sits in that pew, the books aren't a mess. Little things. You say, you know what, that's an act and I'm not saying, oh, look, I, I fixed the songbook. No, I'm saying be humble and be, be pay little things like that stick out. When I walk into a church, you know, I go here. But when I walk into other churches, I pay attention to the building. I pay attention to if there's trash on the floor or if the bathroom is disgusting. I pay attention to those things. So you don't think that other people pay attention to those things? And I would hate to be the reason because I didn't do something that someone does. Now, obviously, there's bigger reasons if a piece of trash is on the floor and someone never comes back to a church. I understand that. But that shouldn't be a hindrance to anybody coming here because we all can participate in that. Maybe you don't have a great speaking ability or you don't have a... Maybe you're not good with children's ministries or you're not good with... Some, you can do that. Everybody can pick up garbage. And you know what? And even if you can't bend over, they make those little squeeze things where you can pick stuff up. So you really don't have an excuse, right? <laughs> so there goes all the excuses. All right. So humility. If you want to be helpful, if you want to be a help, have humility. Second of all, edify. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm sorry. Turn to 1 Corinthians first. First Corinthians chapter 14. In First Corinthians 14 and verse 12, it says, now this is talking about, the chapter starts out talking about charity, um, then it talks about an uncertain sound, right? and speaking in tongues. But then it goes into this, in verse, verse 12 it says, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, so he says, you're, you're, you're zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. You should attempt to excel to edify. Verse 26 how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. So in other words, if it's not edifying, you're not supposed to do it. Right? You're supposed to be zealous in your edifying. You're supposed to, and then turn over to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. In verse 12, 
Verse 12, it says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, and this is the purpose, this is the ministry gifts, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be, more, be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him or into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love." edifying the body of Christ. We should seek to edify. Let me ask you this question. Are you a builder? The actual, and I forgot to give you the definition, sorry. So edify means, the, in the, the old definition of the word, means to build in a literal sense. That's what the word means, to edify. To instruct and improve the mind and knowledge generally, and particularly, particularly, can't say that word, and moral and religious knowledge. Let me ask you this. Are you a builder or a wrecker? You're, you're one or the other. You're either building people up or you're wrecking people. Hopefully you're not a wrecker, right? Do you build people up or do you use corrupt communication, right? It says in, in Ephesians, and I didn't read that verse, um, but let me read it because I meant to. My page broke up on me there. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We're supposed to be ministering grace unto the hearers. How do we do that? We keep corrupt communication out of our mouth. This all goes back to humility. It all goes back to and, it, and we'll deal with this a little bit later. And I'll, we, it, deal, it, it do, has to do with prayer, too. N coming into God's house prepared. You come to church on Sunday, I hope your prayer is, and I'm not always as sincere as I should be in this prayer, but many times I will pray, say, Lord, I don't know how I can help you today because I, I know this. I'll put it this way. I come into church sometimes, and I don't know, I know who it is. The Lord tells these people. The Holy Spirit tells these people. But I've had people come up to me and say the exact word I needed to hear in church. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? That happens by somebody spending time with God mm -hmm. and, and it's asking him and saying, what do I need to say? Or do I just need to just keep my mouth shut? Maybe just my presence there and me smiling and singing is all I, you need from me today. Amen. Maybe that's all it is. Or maybe I'm going to have the exact words to say, and it may be a simple thing, like, I'm praying for you. And that's what that person needed to hear. God knows that. We don't know that. He uses all these things. So that goes, that goes back to the last point we're going to deal with prayer, but... Do you build up people or do you use corrupt communication? Ways we can edify. Quick list, okay? And this is not an exhaustive list, but I'm just going to run through this real quick. We can esteem others higher. The Bible says we ought to esteem others better than who? Ourselves, right? We can be wise in our speech and be appropriate. We can be encouraging. We can be quick to forgive. We can be understanding. Zero, I have this written down, zero gossip. It never helps anybody, <laughs> including the person sharing it. Share knowledge. You say, share knowledge? That can edify? Yeah, that can edify. Maybe you, that's one of the reasons I like Sunday school, is in Wednesday nights when people share knowledge about a passage that we're, we're studying, 
and I'm sure pastor appreciates it too, when they share knowledge and say, hey, this is something I learned. Because somebody gave the testimony this morning, and they said, I've read this passage this many, you know, 500 times, and this is the first time I've seen it in that way. Well, guess what? The other 499 times, you didn't need it that way. There's, okay, think about it this way too. There's a book, my favorite book. is a book, and I think I've had all my kids read it. It's a book called Scout. And it was a book I got for Christmas or my birthday or one sometime. It's a book about this dog, a Doberman Pinscher dog. And it's a Christian book. Love that book. I've read it, I don't know how many times. I could almost quote the book to you. But you know what? I still learn things. And it's a book. It's, not, it's a lifeless book. And I still learn things from that book. I still go, oh, I don't remember that being in the book last time. Right? Or I know, I'm not endorsing movies here, but I know it's a quirky tradition, but every year my, in my family we watch Home Alone. Okay? It makes us laugh. Failure makes us laugh, okay? And I was watching it the other day, and, you know, Kevin goes into the house and does something, and I said, that's the first time I've realized that. I've watched that movie every year for I don't know how many years, right? But I missed it. Well, sometimes I was sleeping during it, but, right? But I was like, wow, I've never seen that before, right? God's Word is much more alive than a movie and a book, and he lets us see things at different times that, that we need. And you know what? When you come to church, you say, or maybe it's a Bible, maybe it's a, a, an encouraging book that you read. He said, hey, I learned this week that whatever, and God gives you the liberty to say that, then say it and share it, right? Share knowledge, share blessings. Say, hey, I, I got a blessing from God's word, or I got this blessing. Uh, stay humble. That's one way we can edify, right? Going back to our first point. And then lastly, show love. And love goes into our next point. So we had uh, how we can help others. We can be humble. We can edify. We can love. And there's different definitions of love. Um, I'm kind of going to use the charity definition of love. But charity, in a general sense, right, is love, benevolence, according to the dictionary. Benevolence, goodwill, that disposition of the heart which inclines men to think favorably of their fellow men and do them good. In a theological sense, it includes supreme love to God and universal goodwill to men. That's a long definition. But it also includes sacrifice. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But turn to John chapter 13. It's also how we're known or should be known. Let's put it that way. In John 13, in verse 34, it says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one one another as I have loved you, and that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. And And I put... I have written in my Bible as a little note to myself, hypocrites don't do this. A hypocrite is someone who says they're a Christian and doesn't love others. When you don't love other people, especially saved people, brothers and sisters in Christ, you're a hypocrite. Because how you show your love for God and how people should say, ah, that guy loves other people. That guy loves the people in his church. They should, that should be a mark, a thing that defines you, that people should look at that and say, that, that's how I know that guy's a Christian, because he loves other people in his church. Or he loves other Christians. That's what we should be known for. First Peter chapter 1. Now, are we all perfect people? No. Do we all have our, our warts and, you know, things that drive people nuts at times? Yes, I'm sure we do. But the Bible still commands us to love 
one another. It says in uh, verse 22 of 1 Peter 1, it says, Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Fervently. We're supposed to love one another fervently. Now, what does the word fervently mean? That means with fervor, right? That means that's not a, you know, a cheap love. That's a, a love that puts their money where their mouth is. That's a love that they say, you know, and I've been guilty of it just as, you know, I've done this, and I'm ashamed to say this, but I've done this. I try not to do this. I try, if I say to somebody, I'm praying for you, I try to pray for them. But I have said to people, hey, I'll pray for you, brother. I've forgotten who they were five minutes later. That's my fault, right? Or I'll do this for you. Now, I don't want to be, I try not to be one of those people, but if I, if I say that I'm going to do something for somebody, I try to be the person that says, I'm going to do this. Amen. Have I always done that? No. But that's, if you truly love someone, you're going to follow through. You're going to do those things. Um, uh, I have this quote, I like this quote. It says, um, where love is thin, faults are thick. What does that mean? If you love somebody, you're going to overlook faults. My wife must really love me because she, she overlooks a lot of faults. But, right, if, if, you're, if your love is thin, guess what? You're not going to, you're, you're, every little thing is going to bother you. Right? You know, uh, if your love is thin, you're gonna uh, you're gonna snap about things that you shouldn't snap about. Why? Because your love is is not the way it should be. How do we show love? Well, we show love, and it goes back to what we've already talked about. We show love by caring. We show love by sacrificing. By you know um, putting others need others needs before ourselves. You know what? Like you, <clears throat> we you have children. You don't really understand this until you have children, but you, you're, you sacrifice for your children. You, you know, uh, I was going to jokingly, and I'll say it, I'll, I'll say it jokingly, because they haven't said anything about money, okay? This is not, I was going to say, you should add the Christians to that list for Christmas, because we're going to be spending a week with them, and they have to feed three teenagers and a pre-kid that eats like a teenager, well, not quite three teenagers, but... Uh, Audra's close, right? They eat a lot. I'm going to say they're going to need an influx of cat, but don't worry, we're going to help, okay? But um, <laughs> they're, they're going to need, you know, the stock in the uh, Piggly Wiggly. They have a Piggly Wiggly there, okay? It's going gonna, it's gonna to go, I don't know if that's where they shop, but it's going to go up or down or something because they're going to have a shortage. But, um, you know, we show, we, we sacrifice, right? Uh, we have sacrificial offerings. We show love. And that going into the last point, we show love by praying for others. And going back to that, if you say you're going to pray for somebody, pray for somebody. If someone, okay, I'll, I'll just say this about myself, okay? If I, and, and how I started thinking about this is I stink, I'll just put it right out there, I stink at asking for help. I am a bull in a china shop. Sometimes, and even if I need help with something, I'll just put my shoulder into it. Not this one, but I'll, I'll put my shoulder into it, and I'll just, and, and my wife will say, why didn't you ask for help? And I'll say, or, or if it's something that I have to teach someone how to do, I'll just go ahead and do it myself because I don't want to deal with teaching someone how to do it. I'm just being honest here, Okay. I don't like to ask for help. And when you have surgery and you, okay, can I tell you, this human, and I have not arrived in the humility department. I just want to put that out there too, okay? When you go to PT and you see 70-year-old ladies there, and they're not old, okay? If you're in your 70s, I'm not calling you old, okay? You're not. You're young still, okay? 
And they're over there with the 15-pound weights. And you're there with a one-pound weight because that's all you're allowed to lift. It's humiliating. They're over there, you know, like it's nothing. And you're over there like this with a one-pound weight. It's humiliating, okay? And, and uh, having, having to ask for a ride or to, you know, can you come You know, thankfully, this time I had surgery, my kids were older, and they, there's a lot they can do. They can do. But having to act, that is humbling. It really is. Because I, I must have a lot of pride. That's what it comes down to. Because I don't like to ask for help. And that's where this thought process started with all this. And, and when you go through something and, you, and you're, you, you struggle, you realize how important prayer is. And, it, and prayer is not just... So I, I started to say... Uh, before I went off on that little tangent there, that if I know personally, if I take the time to ask somebody for prayer, it's a very serious thing. It, I know that there's people in this church that pray. I know that for a fact. I've seen it in my own life. So when I raise my hand and I say, I need prayer for this, or I put a request in, that's a very serious thing because I, I take that very seriously. I don't want to be lighthearted or just throw my hand up, you know, to, you know, some people are, <laughs> some people like to share a prayer request, but it's basically an update on their life. Okay, whatever. But if it, and maybe it is a heartfelt thing with them, but you need to be sincere. That's a sincere thing. Prayer is a serious thing. You know, prayer, uh, that's our last point. So we had, we need to, if we're going to be helping people, we have to be humble we need to edify, we need to love others, and we need to pray. And prayer, and I think we all know what prayer is. I, there was a book, it was about 400 pages. I remember I didn't read the whole thing, but prayer is asking and receiving. Um, a book was written years ago. Um, but in a general sense, okay, in the dictionary, it's the act of asking for a favor, and particularly with earnestness, Earn, earnestness, sorry, intercession for blessing for others. There's actually a much longer definition in the 1828 Dictionary for Prayer. But it also mentions uh, um, talking to a sovereign God on behalf of others. Um, in uh, several points, uh, several different passages in the Bible, um, you'll hear the phrase, or the, word, the phrase is used, brethren, Pray for us. Why? Because they knew how important. What, what is every, and I know this, and, and Pastor Gip isn't the only one that says this. I noticed that in the missions conference. They kept, one thing I've noticed, a lot of missionaries, especially lately, a lot of missionaries are saying, take my prayer card. I don't care if you give, and, and I really believe them when they say this. I don't care if you don't give me any money. Pray for me. Why? Because they know. They know they need God to show up and each one of you in your lives, wherever you, you know, walk into where you work or whatever you deal with on a daily basis, you know your situation and you know you need God to show up on your behalf. Because if he does not show up on your behalf, you're in trouble. I know, I, I can't even explain to you the, the situations that I've been in where the only explanation for it not turning out a lot worse was God showed up. I have no other way to explain it. When you're surrounded and you're the only guy and they're mad and they're angry and they're coming for you and all of a sudden the room gets really quiet and they stop. Not because they don't have the majority. They do have the majority. That's God showing up on your behalf. That's God saying, hey, I hear you. I hear the prayers of other people because I know that there's people that pray for me on a daily basis. I, and they, they check with me. And they come up to me and say, hey, I've been praying for you. What's going on with this? When you ask pointed questions to people about their life, guess what that tells them? That tells them that you are praying for them. And I'll, and I'll say, and this has been said by others, <laughs> I pray for Pastor Moore on weeks like this. <laughs> Because honestly, 
It's been tough. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying my world's falling apart. I'm just saying it takes, you, you, you don't, you, you're not, you know, you're not just thinking about it on Sunday. You're thinking about it throughout the week. And you're, you think you have everything figured out, and then, no, you're not, you're not preaching that. Or, let's work this direction, and then you work that direction, and he goes, nope, you're not doing that one either. And I'm like, oh. And then you, you know what happened to me this afternoon? Press print. And the printer said something, the computer said something about storage. I'm like, storage? I'm printing. I don't, I don't, I don't know about storage. Right? And I thought, what am I going to do? And then I got, like, pulled my phone out and like to take a picture of the screen. <laughs> I didn't know what else to do, and then it, all of a sudden it started to print off. Right? Little things like, I mean, just God saying, hey, you got to rely on me. Don't rely on yourself. He likes to do that. We don't like it. I, I'll just speak for myself. I don't like it, but I like the results of it. Amen. Maybe at the time I'm not, you know, Skip in as I go, got, go down the sidewalk singing, uh, you know, glory to his name. But he, he, he teaches us things. So turn to James chapter 5 and verse 16. We'll be done. James 5 and verse 16. It says in, in James 5, 16, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But that's the key, and it's kind of like that verse in um, Chronicles about if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and turn, right? It comes back to us. It says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Well, what's, what's, what's our job then? Our job is to be a righteous man. Because I want my prayer to avail much. I want it to be a, 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 it's a serious request. I want it to be answered, right? So, let me just ask you this in closing. You want to know how to help your church? You say, how do I help, right? How do you help? You have humility. You, you, you edify one another, you love one another, and you pray for one another. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes, and I'll have a word of prayer, and then the pastor will come up. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you speak to us through your word. I'm thankful for the opportunity uh, to, to preach and the opportunity to um, study these things and to learn from your word, and um, pray that you would use this message and, and, and that it would be a help to people and that they would uh, use it uh, throughout the week. And I would ask that you help us as a church to do our part, to, to love each other, to be right before you, to pray for one another. And I'm thankful for the way um, it's such a blessing when you show up in our lives and you answer prayers and you work in our lives, and we're so thankful for that. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.